Max, when I really want to try to understand reality, all there is, the first question that comes to my mind is, how big is it? Now, not just the universe, as we seem to see, but all of reality. Now, if you go in human history, a uh, hundred years ago, 125 years ago, people thought it was just a few thousand light years. Then it was million, and now it's billion. How can we begin to understand how big can it really be? I think that's a fascinating <laughs> question, and I, I imagine you know, the Native Americans who lived here in Massachusetts thousands of years ago, to them, the universe must have been just the part of Earth that they could walk yeah. in a lifetime, right? <laughs> and then gradually when sailboats were invented and so on, people started discovering that, whoa, the world is just vastly bigger yeah. than we thought. And then some clever Greeks figured out the size of this big ball we live on, and, and the universe sort of became the solar system, right? <laughs> and, and when they figured out how far away Saturn was, they were amazed. Wow, this is so huge. Then there were these little dinky, shiny things, right? The stars, <laughs> and which were still farther away. And, and when people realized that they were dramatically farther away than the planets, you know, so far away that it would take light several years to get here. I, I think that blew people's minds again. And, and yet, that's still only our backyard, as <laughs> we've come to realize. Right? My, my grandma passed away recently at age 102. Wow. And, Good uh, genetics. <laughs> oh, I got those genes, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I realized you know, she lived in a different universe than us because when she was a teenager, the universe was our galaxy or a little piece of it. And only in 1925 uh, did Edward Hubble realize that this wispy spiral-shaped mm. nebula called Andromeda was actually what they then called an island universe, hundreds of billions of stars still farther away. And now... We've pushed the boundary again, and now when people talk about our universe, we usually mean the interior of this sphere here, which is the, just a part of space from which light has had time to get to us so far. So and what is this? This is simply the region from which light has had time to reach us here on Earth during the 14 billion years since the Big Bang, mm -hmm. and since light can only travel at a finite speed. This is all we can see. And does stuff go on out on... So Beyond. we can see back right now the, of the radius of this thing, which is 14 billion years, but that, that's seeing it then, so this has expanded since we see that light, since we're seeing it 14 billion years ago. So now the diameter of that, if twice the radius plus expansion, right. is what, 40 billion light years or that's something? That's right. And then the million-dollar question is, is there still more space beyond that or not? And it's funny you ask, because I was at uh, my son Alexander's preschool recently giving a talk about space. And <laughs> one of his four-year-old little pals <laughs> raised his hand and said, I have a question. Does space go on forever? <laughs> and I was thinking, this is, this is so amazing. Perfect this four-year-old asked a question that I don't know the answer to. <laughs> and um, you might think it has to go on forever because, as the kid put it, you know, if it ends, then what's, after what's that? beyond? You know, clearly, you wouldn't expect there to be some sign saying, you know, space ends here, <laughs> mind the gap. Yeah. But actually, Albert Einstein told us that space could be finite without being finite in such a, a dumb way. Because he, he taught us that space might not just be the f boring flat space that Euclid mm -hmm. had invented, but space could be curved or donut-shaped so that you just go really far in one direction and wind up from there. Whoa, <laughs> you're back again. Yeah. That's right. Well, y you've, you've conceptualized some ways of thinking way beyond what we can see here, and you have a number of different levels. Uh, uh, tell, tell, tell me about how, how those work. Uh, this is not even one, the whole universe is not even one of your levels, right? <laughs> so this is what I would call our universe. It's the part yeah. we can observe if we are very patient and we're trying to map out. And then the obvious question is, are there others? So I believe that the space certainly goes on here. My guess is that space goes on forever, which means that there are infinitely many other regions like this, which you could call the level one multiverse, if you want. But multiverse those, meaning many universes be beyond what we can see, but in the same plane, the same sort of stuff that we, we have. We just never will be able to see it. Exactly. Because space has expanded faster than light exactly. can go. Exactly. It's yeah. still just one big space. Mm. It, there are just many different regions which are actually causally disconnected but in the sense that we cannot see what's happening over there. But they're equally real. And if you went there 
things would look kind of the same, you would learn the same laws of physics in school, except that things would have played out a little bit differently there, because the planets there were created in slightly different places, and if there's a planet over there that looks like Earth, you know, the first one you come to is probably called Schmirth or, <laughs> or, or something different, and, and slightly different <laughs> events played out, but it's not that different. And then, the best theory we have for what made this space, called inflation, actually predicts not only that you should have an infinite space, but that if you go really, really far away, you come to a region where new space is being stretched and, and made, and beyond that, there could be still other regions, which are you might call level two, because once you get to those, it might even be that some of the basic properties of space, like how many kinds of quarks there are and so on, actually differ. The strength of gravity, all the different constants of physics may be very different. All the Th now, those are regions that, are, that, that have a, 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 a nucleation, a bubbling off or a squeezing off. So now that's totally separate. So in, in principle, you can't even get there, even if you could go faster than light, theoretically. <laughs> that's right. But it's important to remember, there's still only, only one space. Yeah. The only thing is that Einstein taught us that space isn't just this boring, static yeah. space that Euclid taught us, you know, a stage upon wh which events unfold, but rather that space itself is dynamic, like a sheet of rubber. You know, space can have yeah. ripples in it that travel with the speed of light, called gravity waves, and space can actually stretch. You can make more volume, and space can curve into black holes and so on. And what's going on in this space is that when you have... A region where it's stretching really, really fast, if you try to fly through there in a spaceship, it's kind of like if I were to try to walk down the up escalator, <laughs> but I could go only slower than the escalator, I, I'd never get there. So if, if for all practical purposes, it's a parallel universe, even though it's still just in our space. Okay, so that's your level two. That's the level two. And we're still not all the way there to how big everything could possibly be. That's right. What's your next step? I'm scaring me. <laughs> <laughs> What's so scary about the big grand universe? I can't, are you agoraphobic? <laughs> the, uh, I, I kind of find it refreshing that there's more to it. Uh, well, it's, it's awesome. It's scary in a, in, in a, in a, in a grand way. It's, a, maje it's a, ma a majesty beyond conception. But so what's, I think what's your level three? So the third level is... is a slightly different kind of space, which mathematicians have given a fancy name for it, called Hilbert space, which is infinite dimensional and much more abstract and hard to conceptualize. But the basic idea is that if you uh, look at a window at night and you see your own reflection in it, and you also see the street light outside, mm -hmm. that, that means that some of the light must have bounced on the glass and gone out again, and some of it must have gone through. Mm -hmm. Yet, the people who invented quantum physics realized that uh, since light is made of little particles, photons, that must mean that each particle would then have to somehow either bounce or go through. And that couldn't actually be what was going on, because basically the p light particles won't notice holes that are much smaller than their wavelength. And the f shocking solution to this is that the light, each photon actually both goes through <laughs> and bounces back. And you're like, whoa, what's with this? And this is something which physicists have now argued about ever since 1925, what it means. And there's a general consensus, though, that the microworld really is counterintuitive and weird. And little particles can be in two places at once. If you start a particle in only one place, then in a sense, when you look at it, your mind state becomes two different mind states at once, one that saw the light go through and one that didn't. And you tell your friends, and their <laughs> mind states also enter this funny sort of superposition. And before you know it, you have the quantum parallel universes. Branches of branches of branches. Yes. So there is, again, just one quantum physics. And, and everywhere in this funny Hilbert space, these different things have happened. But from our subjective point of view, those other worlds are actually not light years and light years away. They're, in a sense, <laughs> <laughs> right here, right? And they just branched out. A and we can't see those. We live in one of those branches of branches of branches, but there's almost an infinite number of those? Well, people would have dismissed this as just flaky philosophy if it weren't for the fact that if you have a little particle that's in two places at once, sometimes you can recombine the two branches again and get strange phenomena known as quantum interference, where 
it's very clear that the particle somehow did both things at the same time. So we cannot discard this. And you might say, well, maybe little particles are a little bit schizophrenic, and but maybe this doesn't apply to big things like us, but we're made, we're made out of particles, right? So this is the many worlds interpretation where it's possible you're saying that these many worlds are not just a mathematical fiction, but a true representation of reality. Exactly. And, and this was invented by Hugh Everett, who was a grad student at Princeton back in 57, a great hero of mine. And <laughs> it was it's a beautiful theory, in my opinion. And he was just so far ahead of his time, he couldn't even get a job in physics. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about level four. I'm scared to ask. <laughs> Ah, so you want something still bigger? <laughs> well, I want reality. That's why I came to you. You're going to tell me what's real. Okay, so all my colleagues here at MIT work in theoretical physics. They would love to come up with some equations which just describe everything about the universe so succinctly that they can put it on a T-shirt right. and students can walk around yeah. with them. And so suppose you succeed and you make that T-shirt. And that describes all there is. Then you have to ask yourself, what about the, why those equations? Why not some others, right? Mathematicians study all kinds of different equations, and they would argue about which are more elegant and which are less elegant. And I feel that it would seem nuts if there was some basic asymmetry built into math, that some equations are allowed to describe a physical universe and others aren't. So my guess is rather that every mathematical structure which mathematicians can study is on the same footing and describes a real physical universe. Now you say that very calmly and very rationally, but what you're saying is that every mathematical structure, which most people think are abstract and uh, uh, pure math, describes a physical reality, and so each set of equations is like a whole other, can't even say universe, but a, but a way of existing. That's right. When we first look around us in this world, it doesn't seem all that mathematical, right? And if we take a physics class in high school, we get bombarded with some equations. But that's still supposed to just be some approximate description. But one of the most amazing things I think we've discovered over the centuries in theoretical physics is that there's mathematics everywhere. Galileo exclaimed that nature is, the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics, right? And after he had made that observation, people discovered still more irregularities and amazing mathematical relations. Wigner wrote a famous essay in the 60s saying, this is unreasonable. How can math work so well? And then after that, the standard model of particle physics was discovered. And I think that the reason that the nature is so well described by math is because in a very deep sense, it really is math. when we talk about things like space, right? if you go to the math department here and you go to some talk, they might give a talk about space. Mm -hmm. Except to the to mathematician, the space is a purely mathematical object. They'll study three-dimensional ones or 57-dimensional ones or whatever. Right? And if you go talk to one of my theoretical physics colleagues here, they might easily talk about um, how the how the world we live in is a three plus one dimensional manifold. And that, those are math words, which they're using to describe the space time, which we usually think of as a physical thing, right? We often think, you'll hear theoretical physicists, if you ask them what a particle is, they'll give this incredibly glib answer and say, oh, a particle is an irreproducible, ir irreducible representation of the Poincare group. <laughs> now, don't even ask me what that means, but the point is, things which mathematicians study just for their own beauty have turned out to have this uncanny match with things that we observe around us in nature. And I think it's telling something very basic. 